Let's talk about prejudice. Prejudice is like an enormous buzzword these days, and it is the big bad. It's the thing that you're not supposed to have. You're not supposed to have prejudice. You're not supposed to be bigoted, right? And prejudice has become synonymous with something that truly is evil and bad, which is racism, right? Prejudice usually means th this kind of just gut feeling, this, this uninformed, illogical hatred of people who are different than you. That's prejudice, the way we use it today, right? And you can have prejudice against all kinds of marginalized groups, right? You can have prejudice against black people, you can have prejudice against gay people, you know, and if you're prejudiced, it's like, you know, it's almost like the, the cardinal sin. It's the great sin, right? And this, I'm going to argue today, is like a really silly way of thinking about prejudice. Because the word, right, what, is it, what, what are the two words that are in that word, right? Pre-judge, right? It's a judgment that you have in advance. Maybe you didn't think your way to it on your own, right? It sort of exists, just it's there as part of your, your intuition, right? It's part of this. Everybody has this like starter kit as they grow into adulthood of things that they tend to view, you know, in a favorable light, these instincts that we have, we don't quite know where they come from, right? In the bigger sense, that's prejudice. And to condemn all prejudice of that kind, right, all of our intuitions, all of our natural assumptions, right, to condemn those because they're not reasoned through, right, because we haven't thought them all the way through, is to participate in the logic of the French Revolution, right? The idea, and we've been talking about this now for two episodes, that unless you can prove something with a mathematical syllogism, the if A, then B, therefore C, right? Um, unless you can prove things that way in this kind of quasi-mathematical way, it's not worth anything at all. Your intuitions, your natural assumptions, your sort of ge general ideas about things, the way that you were taught growing up, the way that you, you know, live in a certain country, right? Those things are worthless, and probably they're also so evil, right? Because there are those prejudices, it, we have been argued that no prejudice is okay. We've been tricked into believing that no such thing as prejudice is okay. Basically what I've been saying this whole time is you have to know and understand where you come from. There is no better way to train students in that discipline than the classic learning test or CLT. These are my pals who are fighting back against the woke trends that we've been seeing in the SAT, the PSAT, the ACT, right? These companies like the College Board that compose some of these tests have gone completely off the rails. Students are being forced to train to read biased passages, to read these like blab, this blather essentially. Um, and CLT is just a way to totally fight back against all of that. It's a new standardized test that puts kids in front of Plato, Augustine, Milton, Austin, Frederick Douglass, the greats, right? The people that we study on this show. If you know a high school junior or their parents, tell them to take the June 19th CLT using the discount code heretics to get 20% off the registration fee. So you go to cltexam.com and register using the offer code heretics for the June 19th test. You can also check out their podcast, the Anchored podcast, and it's so good. They got all kinds of awesome guests, myself included. Um, so check them out and go to cltexam.com to register for the June 19th test. You get 20% off when you use the discount code heretics. All right, back to Burke. I'm going to argue with Edmund Burke this week that you have a right to be suspicious of things that contradict your common sense and your intuition and your instincts because the same place that gave you your instincts, namely that tradition, right, that that history that you are born into a time and place, the same tradition and history that gave you your instincts also gave you things like science, right? We develop these things in societies and then the society turns back around like a like an Ouroboros, right? Like a snake eating itself and just eats itself alive when you say, well, yes, now science proves that we must segregate racially, right? In colleges, like now we have this new rationale and this, you know, it, it, we get these things from a certain place, and that is the same place that encodes, that, that instills our instincts into us. And so we have a right to be suspicious of somebody like Bill Gates, who says, oh, all country, all rich countries should eat synthetic beef, right? It was recently, there was, uh, speaking of studies, there was recently a poll conducted that like 70% of men would rather die than, than give up meat, right? That's 
prejudice, that's instinct, that's intuition, and we have a right to that. We have a right to say, well, Bill Gates, like, you had a sham marriage in which you got a romantic weekend every year with your girlfriend, with your ex, and then you divorced, you know, destroying this 27-year-long uh, marriage that you had, right? You, <laughs> you don't really have a right to say something to me without, like, serious work. <laughs> so when he says, like, let's blot out the sun, because then it'll be good for the climate, right? And when we say, well, the sun is good and healthy, right? You know, and we don't need to produce a study. When somebody says that gender is a construct, we don't need to produce a study to show, an argument, you know, a, a sort of syllogistic argument to show why men and women are different, why there are only men and women and not 57 other genders. That's what I'm going to be arguing today, and that it is a reasonable, rational thing to believe in those instincts, to trust them, you know, and to reform them gradually if we reform them, rather than to disregard them as of no account in the arguments that we make, the ways that we do politics. Remember back to what this whole thing is about, right? We've been talking about Burke's reflections on the revolution in France. And I said last week that one of the things that most appalled Burke about the revolution, right, was that, you know, because at first, right, it started to look like maybe this was going to be a good thing along the lines of the American Revolution, a step in the right direction. Burke wasn't totally sure. What changed his mind? Well, in October of 1789, they led the king in, they called it triumph, right, out of, out of Versailles and into Paris. This appalled Burke. Uh, and he saw in it a, an, an, an atrocious, uh, an atrocious insult to all that is good, to everything that leads us forward, especially tradition. And the, he, the word he uses is chivalry. So I'm going to read now the most, really the most famous passage from the book and some of Burke's best prose. One really great way that you can show your support for the stuff that we talk about on this show and for this show itself is with their awesome Young Heretics swag. You go to youngheretics.com slash shop and you can pick up all kinds of cool stuff. I love this stuff. We test out all these products. So we've got t-shirts, there are hats. There's one shirt that says, we're reading Homer and screw you that people have really liked. Uh, there's stickers too. You put them on your laptop and stuff. I love all this stuff. Go to youngheretics.com slash shop. When you get your merch, tweet a picture of yourself using it or wearing it. And I will retweet you because I absolutely love that. And y'all look incredible. By the way, we are currently reviewing possibilities for new merch, other stuff that we might do. So like, I don't know, maybe a muscle shirt. A lot of people have been asking for that. If you want to be able to make suggestions for the new Young Heretics merch, you have to be a Young Heretics VIP. So to do that, you go to youngheretics.com slash locals, sign up to become a VIP on locals. I highly recommend the annual membership and you can check out uh, the different suggestions for merch. One more time to get your merch, it's youngheretics.com slash shop. So here's Burke on Marie Antoinette, who has become for us this symbol of decadence, right? And by the way, Burke concedes, as we talked about this last week too, right? Burke concedes that rich people can be extremely obnoxious, even oppressive, right? It's not that he doesn't think that he that you need to reform the monarchy, you need to hold the monarchy in check, as in moments like the Magna Carta, right? Um, but, but he finds this complete insult to all the ideals, the, the nobility of the monarchy, just absolutely appalling. Here's why. He writes, it is now 16 or 17 years since I saw the Queen of France, then the Dauphiness, at Versailles, and surely never lighted on this orb, which she hardly seemed to touch a more delightful vision. I saw her just above the horizon, decorating and cheering the elevated sphere she just began to move in, glittering like the morning star, full of life and splendor and joy. Oh, what a revolution! And what an heart I must have to contemplate without emotion that elevation and that fall. Little did I dream when she added titles of veneration to those of enthusiastic, distant, respectful love that she should ever be obliged to carry the sharp antidote against disgrace concealed in that bosom. Little did I dream that I should have lived to see such disasters fallen upon her in a nation of gallant men, in a nation of men of honor and of cavaliers. I thought 10,000 swords must have leaped from their scabbards to avenge even a look that threatened her with insult. But the age of chivalry is gone, that of sophisters 
economists, and calculators has succeeded, and the glory of Europe is extinguished forever. Never, never more shall we behold that generous loyalty to rank and sex, that proud submission, that dignified obedience, that subordination of the heart, which kept alive, even in servitude itself, the spirit of an exalted freedom, the unbought grace of life, the cheap defense of nations, the nurse of manly sentiment and heroic enterprise is gone. It is gone, that sensibility of principle, that chastity of honor, which felt a stain like a wound, which inspired courage whilst it mitigated ferocity, which ennobled whatever it touched, and under which vice itself lost half its evil by losing all its grossness. What Burke is saying in these really immortal words is the messy, long, slow march of tradition that has accumulated all of these seemingly superstitious, seemingly needless, seemingly irrational practices of decorum, you know, the nurse of manly sentiment that teaches a man to stand up in defense of a woman, whatever woman, but especially a woman as elevated as, as Marie Antoinette, to stand up in defense of a woman degraded and shamed, right? These things come to us from tradition. They are instilled in our hearts, he says, cheaply. That is, we get them. They're baked in to our society if our society follows its traditional mores, its, its sort of rites and rituals, its habits, its customs, and they express something. They are not useless. They are not irrational. They express the reality of nobility, right? And they, they lead us toward to aspire to things. And now I know that I'm speaking here as an American to many Americans, not all, but many people who listen to this show are Americans. And I know that we have done away with the monarchy for the sake of republic. I've argued, I've argued for republics before, but what I have never argued for is stripping politics and communal life of its ritual, of its magic, of its nobility. Why do you think we built Washington, D.C. the way we did? Why all those fluted columns? Why all these marble monuments, these alabaster uh, decorations, right? Why any of that? Because we knew what the great monarchies, we learned from the great monarchies of Europe, especially from England, that, that life is not mere mathematics. Life is spirituality too, and nobility, and to have symbols of that nobility to which you aspire, impossible though it may be to defend using syllogisms or mathematical arguments or studies or, or polls, right? Impossible though it may be to defend, if you take that away, you take away everything that ennobles human life. And so that's what Burke says next, and this is really chilling. He says, now all is to be changed. All the pleasing illusions which made power gentle and obedience liberal, which harmonized the different shades of life, and which, by a bland assimilation, incorporated into politics the sentiments which beautify and soften private society, are to be dissolved by this new conquering empire of light and reason. All the decent drapery of life is to be rudely torn off. All the superadded ideas, furnished from the wardrobe of a moral imagination, which the heart owns and the understanding ratifies as necessary to cover the defects of our naked, shivering nature and to raise it to dignity in our own estimation, are to be exploded as a ridiculous, absurd, and antiquated fashion. On this scheme of things, a king is but a man, a queen is but a woman, a woman is but an animal, and an animal not of the highest order. That chilling last sentence that I just read, right, is perfectly mirrored in all of our materialist ways now of talking about life. We don't know that this comes to us from this kind of hyper-rationalist, abstracted, uh, sort of French philosophic turn, but it does, right, that, you know, that all of this superstition, all of this, you know, what, what Lewis and Tolkien would have called fairy stories, right, that are built into our communal ways of life together, if you just sweep them away, you'll get it pure, rational life. What do you get out of that? You get birthing people. You get people with uteruses, right? 
you get these disgusting, degraded ways of talking about people in, in the pure, cold tones of what you imagine to be reason and rationality. But of course, your reason and your rationality comes to you from where? From your society, from your civilization, from your tradition. And so when you strip those things away, what you end up with instead is self-destruction and illogic. That is what happened to the French Revolution, as I have now hinted at, described several times throughout this series. Here is an article from The Times, a British paper, September 10th, 1792. Now remember, reflections on the revolution in France came out in 1790. Burke did not know that this would happen, and yet here is a description of the September massacres, they were called, and this was only a prelude, only a beginning. The Times writes, The streets of Paris, strewed with the carcasses of the mangled victims, are become so familiar to the sight that they are passed by and trod on without any particular notice. The mob think no more of killing a fellow creature who is not even an object of suspicion than wanton boys would of killing a cat or a dog. We have it from a gentleman who has been but too often an eyewitness to the fact. In the massacre last week, every person who had the appearance of a gentleman, whether stranger or not, was run through the body with a pike. He was, of course, an aristocrat, and that was a sufficient crime. A ring, a watch chain, a handsome pair of buckles, a new coat, or a good pair of boots in a word. Everything which marked the appearance of a gentleman, and which the mob fancied was sure to cost the owner his life. Equality was the pistol, and plunder the object. These were the days of newspaper stories, let me tell you. But, th but this is why? Why is all this happening? Because a king is but a man, a queen is but a woman, a woman is but an animal, and an animal not of the highest order. When you reduce everything to mere mathematical materialist logic, you turn yourself into an animal. Remember that we talked about this also when we talked about Dostoevsky, right? This kind of pure utilitarian logic. Well, why shouldn't I kill one person if it'll, you know, make everyone better? Why? Because it is an appalling atrocity and an offense against God and man. Thou shalt not commit murder in cold blood. Here is another passage that I think we could we would do well to listen to, in which Burke defends more this idea of, of prejudice and native affection. And so remember that Burke here is as much thinking about England as about France, and he's responding to Dr. Price, who has given this sermon at the Old Jewry um, in defense of the French, in celebration, really, of the, of the leading and triumph of the king and queen, and uh, in uh, analogizing it to uh, Britain's glorious bloodless revolution. Why do I feel so differently from the Reverend Dr. Price and those of his lay flock who will choose to adopt the sentiments of his discourse? For this plain reason, because it is natural I should, because we are so made as to be affected at such spectacles with melancholy sentiments upon the unstable condition of mortal prosperity and the tremendous uncertainty of human greatness, because in those natural feelings we learn great lessons, in our natural feelings we learn Great lessons, because in events like these, our passions instruct our reason. Because when kings are hurled from their thrones by the supreme director of this great drama and become the objects of insult to the base and of pity to the good, we behold such disasters in the moral as we should behold a miracle in the physical order of things. We are alarmed into reflection. Our minds, as it has long since been observed, are purified by terror and pity. Our weak, unthinking pride is humbled under the dispensations of a mysterious wisdom. There is a mysterious wisdom contained in your natural affections, your natural inclinations and desires. And remember that Burke thinks that the state of nature is never pure, right? And so it's always through society, which is also natural to us, that we guide ourselves, if we're doing it right, right, toward feeling, loving, this is the old ancient Greek way of saying this, loving what you should love and hating what you should hate. And these thumotic reactions. We've talked about the thumos before, right? The kind of core, the, the seat in the chest of one's uh, manly impulses, of one's courage, and of one's, you know, intense emotions, even, even things like anger, right? If we feel it, if we see an injustice, these things are trained up in us. They are not rational. They inform reason. And to strip them away from reason is to create men without chests uh, in the famous C.S. Lewis line. And we know the terrible things that men without chests can do. That was essentially what happened in the terror in the French Revolution. 
And so what's the alternative, right? What do we do instead? Here is another passage now from, from Burke that is, uh, in, invents this very famous little uh, idea of what's called the little platoon. Turbulent, discontented men of quality, in proportion as they are puffed up with personal pride and arrogance, generally despise their own order. One of the first symptoms they discover of a selfish and mischievous ambition is a profligate disregard of a dignity which they partake with others. Now, this is, he's basically saying that, like, class traitors, that is, uh, the wealthy and powerful who condemn wealth and power, are showing in themselves a certain ingratitude and peevishness. And this is something that we see now, right? Famously, the one of the co-founders of BLM was just revealed to be buying all these expensive properties in California. Um, and But there's a million examples of this, right? It's the aristocracy who goes in for Marxism. It's, it, and, they, and then they sort of do this thing called consciousness raising, where they have to convince people that they're oppressed. You have to convince gay people in this country that they're, you know, that every word is a microaggression. You have to convince people that, like, the, the police are out trying to shoot black people. These lies they tell people. I mean, I don't know if you guys saw this video of this poor woman pulled over in just an absolute state of horror because she had been told by the media, by the New York Times, right, by all of these, by these powerful moneyed interests who have an interest in her being radicalized, in feeling as if she's under assault by every American cop, right? This is what, how these revolutions actually work. They're, they're inner revolutions within the upper classes of these people that are disgusted with their own wealth on the lines of some of the stuff we talked about last week, right? This idea that Christianity condemns wealth or at least tells us that wealth um, is a barrier to holiness. And therefore, when, once we kind of move away from Christianity, we just have that, that self-condemnation, right? So he's, so he's saying, what's the alternative? He says, to be attached, this is Burke again, to be attached to the subdivision, to love the little platoon we belong to in society is the first principle, the germ, as it were, of public affections. It is the first link in the series by which we proceed towards a love to our country and to mankind. The interests of that portion of social arrangement is a trust in the hands of all those who compose it, as none but bad men would justify it in abuse, none but traitors would barter it away for their own personal advantage. We are now being told how evil it is to love our native land, to love your country. Right? Patriotism is next to jingoism, and all the horrors of the 20th century were all about nationalism, right? But this is deeply, deeply unnatural, and we think that by throwing off the shackles of borders, right, by getting rid of the nation state, well, then we'll just create this grand, you know, brotherhood of man all across the world, and, you know, or brotherhood of, of person, right, all across the world uh, in love. But of course, as as Burke recalls, as, as the stoic idea of oikeosis reminds us, right, these things don't actually happen in abstract from the top down. They are built from the ground upward. Your love of even of yourself, of your home, of your family, right? These are the, the schools in which you learn to love other men, in which, you know, love thy neighbor as thyself doesn't make any sense unless you first love what is nearest and dearest to you, and then you expand that love outward throughout the world. Here's Aristotle again in the politics in which he's arguing, by the way, against communism. The Greek word is koinonia, the sharing of things in common, uh, which Plato had advocated, or at least Socrates in Plato's Republic suggests that all wives, all property should be held in common among the guardians of the state. Here's how Aristotle refutes that. This is Aristotle's Politics, Book 2, Chapter 4. Socrates praises above all the cities being one which it is held to be, and which he asserts to be, the work of affection. Just as in the discourses on love, we know that Aristophanes speaks of lovers who from an excess of affection desire to grow together, the two of them becoming one. Remember, we read Plato's Symposium, right? That's what, he's, that's what Aristotle is referring to here. Now here it must necessarily happen that both or one of them disappear in the union. In the city, however, affection necessarily becomes diluted through this sort of community. And the fact that a father least of all says mine of his son or the son of his father, just as adding much water to a small amount of wine makes the mixture imperceptible, so too does this result with respect to the kinship with one another based on these terms, it being least of all necessary in a regime of this sort for a father to take thought for his sons as sons, or a son for his father as father, or brothers for one another as 
brothers. He's saying if you try to make people love the whole world equally, what you really do is you dilute their love. You don't expand it, stretch it out across the whole world. You just basically make nobody have any responsibility or devotion or affection or natural human sentiment for anybody, right? This is communism, right? To hold all property in common is to have no attachment, no care for one particular part of the region, right? Or to one home, one garden, right? That you cultivate. And Burke is saying that that is the basis for all the love that we then show to the rest of the world, to our nation, right? Um, loving the little platoon in which you find yourself. One of the most disheartening things for me about our woke revolution is the crackdown on free speech. And we're seeing it everywhere, but we're especially seeing it online on these platforms where people build up communities where I, you know, have been connecting with you through places like Twitter. And, you know, as we build this show, as we get to know one another, as we talk to each other about the great ideas that inspire us and drive us to be better ourselves, it sucks to get kicked off the internet, right? And it can happen at a moment's notice. They can just zap you out of existence. I would never know where you had gone, right? How would we find each other if we just got deleted by Twitter or Instagram or Facebook? Well, we came up with an answer to that, and that's locals. So over on Locals, which is a platform run by free speech extremist, my pal Dave Rubin, um, I've created the Young Heretics Community, which is a place for us to talk more deeply about the stuff in this show, the great ideas of the West, without anybody owning or intervening in that relationship. So if you go to youngheretics.com slash locals, you can join the community, see what it's all about. And if you become a VIP, you get a bunch of extra stuff to go more deep into this uh, great tradition. So you get all episodes a week in advance without ads. You get a bunch of extra stuff from me, like I do live stream Q&As. I write articles that you can only get if you're a VIP. Uh, you can now make suggestions for new kinds of merch and ask mailbag questions. Um, so if you go to youngheretics.com slash locals, we can enter again into this community where we really do you know, get to know one another better. I've loved people are showing me like the books that they're reading and we've been sharing workout tips and all this stuff is so cool. Um, Currently, we just announced that you can get an annual membership for 56 bucks, and that's four months for free, because otherwise it's seven bucks per month. So I highly recommend getting that annual membership, 56 bucks, youngheretics.com slash locals. Can't wait to see you there. So here's, by contrast, though, what France does is it divides its territories up into these geometric quadrants. Um, and these quadrants are supposed to be, you know, the basis for, I mean, one ironic thing is that they they have still a property qualification. After all this, after all this dispossession and, and violence, they still have a property qualification for participation in government. But even before that, Burke objects to the dividing up of France into these little uh, little quadrants. And here's what he says about this. To a person who takes a view of the whole, the strength of Paris thus formed will appear a system of general weakness. It is boasted that the geometrical policy has been adopted, that all local ideas should be sunk, and that the people should no longer be Gascons, Picards, Bretons, Normans, but Frenchmen, with one country saying, erase all these tribal, these old tribal distinctions, right? Uh, with one country, one heart, and one assembly. But instead of being all Frenchmen, the greater likelihood is that the inhabitants of that region will shortly have no country. No man ever was attached by a sense of pride, partiality, or real affection to a description of square measurement. He never will glory in belonging to the checker number 71 or to any other badge ticket. We begin our public affections in our families. No cold relation is a zealous citizen. We pass on to our neighborhoods and our habitual provincial connections. These are inns and resting places. Such divisions of our country as have been formed by habit and not by a sudden jerk of authority were so many little images of the great country in which the heart found something which it could fill. So... This is these, you know, he has these innumerable, beautiful descriptions of the way that we form affections and love. And this comes as part of his sort of very detailed, extremely learned and informed survey of the proposed government of the Assemblée Nationale, that is the National Assembly. We don't have time really to get into the details of his careful parsing of, of all those different, I mean, he just absolutely skewers every 
decision that they've made constitutionally. But I do want, as in, by way of closing and by way of warning of, of where all of this stuff leads, I want to read some portions from his assessment of the military, because it's in the military. Basically, Burke thinks that by reducing government to these kind of simplistic plans, these, these hyper-geometric plans, they've removed the bonds of allegiance and affection and the careful checks and balances that would give any authority to anything other than force. Force now has authority. Force, wealth, power, right? They've, they've governed themselves purely by this logic of force, and he says the discipline within the military is falling apart. There's a reason for this. Mil the, I mean, military men are in, are in terrible shape under this uh, new government, it turns out, and they're doing, they're becoming mutinous. They're becoming rebellious. Why? Because they've been taught, right, that they are men and citizens and they have a right to govern themselves, right? And so the principle they're expecting now, the French are expecting now, or the leaders of the National Assembly are expecting that people will stand on decorum or on duty in the military where they themselves have just thrown duty out the window. And so Burke, in a remarkably prescient series of passages, sees where all of this is leading. And we're going to, at the end here, just read some of these passages. So at the time, he's referring to reports from Monsieur de la Tour du Pain, who is the uh, Minister of War. And uh, this is a man who's sympathetic to the revolution and is trying, and he's kind of an older statesman, but he's trying to put a positive spin on things. But he is reporting, right, that, the, that there are rumblings, terrible rumblings of mutiny within the army. Burke says, I cannot help pausing here for a moment to reflect upon the expressions of surprise which this minister has let fall relative to the excesses he relates. To him, the departure of the troops from their ancient principles of loyalty and honor seems quite inconceivable. Surely those to whom he addresses himself know the causes of it but too well. They know the doctrines, that is, the leaders of the assembly know the doctrines, which they have preached, the decrees which they have passed, the practices which they have countenanced. The soldiers remember the 6th of October. That's a great line. They remember the subversion of monarchic authority. They, re they recollect the French guards. They have not forgot the taking of the king's castles in Paris and at Marseille. That the governors in both places were murdered with impunity is a fact that has not passed out of their minds. They do not abandon the principles laid down so ostentatiously and laboriously of the equality of men. They cannot shut their eyes to the degradation of the whole noblesse of France and the suppression of the very idea of a gentleman. The total abolition of titles and distinctions is not lost upon them, but Monsieur Dupin is astonished at their disloyalty when the doctors of the assembly have taught them at the same time the respect due to laws. It is easy to judge which of the two sorts of lessons men with arms in their hands are likely to learn. As to the authority of the king, we may collect from the minister himself, if any argument on that head were not quite superfluous, that it is not of more consideration with these troops than it is with everybody else. One of the themes that we haven't really touched upon yet is that the assembly kept the king around as this sort of degraded figurehead and this Paul's Burke, this sort of, it, it's like an, an insult by flattery, essentially. And he's saying that our soldiers, army men aren't fooled. They see what, what's going on here. They see this is rule by power. And they see they have arms in their hands. What do you think the consequence of this is going to be? And so in uh, this next passage, he talks about what the consequence is going to be. It is besides to be considered whether an assembly like yours, even supposing that it was in possession of another sort of organ through which its orders were to pass, is fit for promoting the obedience and discipline of an army. It is known that armies have hitherto yielded a very precarious and uncertain obedience to any senate or popular authority, and they will, least of all, yield it to an assembly which is to have only a continuance of two years. The officers must totally lose the characteristic disposition of military men if they see, with perfect submission and due admiration, the dominion of pleaders, especially when they find that they have a new court to pay to an endless succession of those pleaders, whose military policy and the genius of whose command, if they should have any, must be as uncertain as their duration is transient. In the weakness of one kind of authority and in the fluctuation of all, the officers of an army will remain for some time mutinous and full of faction until some popular general who understands the art of conciliating the soldiery and who possesses the true spirit of command shall draw the eyes of all men upon 
himself. If you're following along at home, you know that this prophecy, which at the time was still a prophecy based purely on the logic that Burke saw playing out in the early days of this revolution, which had not yet even devolved into terror, what happened on 18 Brumaire, which was the date of the calendar when Napoleon took over, this very prophecy was fulfilled and Napoleon would sweep through Europe, shocking and appalling all those whom he trampled underfoot. The whole succession of the 19th century, everything that then happened throughout the rest of the really history in Europe, right, is contained within this wisdom and insight of Burke's political philosophy. He saw it happening. He knew it would. Why? Because if you put these elements together, he said, this is what you get. It's like if you put powder and a match together, you get an explosion. And by the way, this is now going on in France right now. Uh, not terribly long ago, 20 retired military generals, 80 officers, and 1,000 lower-ranking soldiers signed an open letter. I'm reading actually now from the American Mind, which is the web website of the Claremont Institute where I work. Um, 80 officers and 1,000 lower-ranking soldiers signed an open letter expressing concern over mortal dangers they say face the Republic. President Macron's government has instructed the Army Chief of Staff to discipline the signatories for inciting insurrection. Why was this open letter so appalling? Because decrying, decrying the uh, attempts of the ruling classes to tear the French people apart using critical race theory, using uh, all sorts of radical wokeism, they essentially warned of a coup. Now, let me be very, very clear, right? I have said now at great length and at the cost of some capital among some members of my audience, right, I have said that I deplore the idea of, of insurrection. I deplore the idea of revolution. I don't think that's what happened in our capital in, on January 6th, but I believe that, you know, if ever it were to come to blows, that would be a terrible failure of us all. But I have also said over and over again that if you beat people down, if you mismanage them, if you tell them that their bodies are mere flesh, if you destroy and insult everything that they hold dear naturally, you get violent antipathy. You get people who are hostile toward you in, a, in terrible and terrifying ways. This is why this stuff is so bad, in addition to being morally bad, right? That when you tear people apart, you get stuff like this. You get these incendiary letters coming out of the military, right, to talk in this way. Remember that the military, right, is the force of the government. And if the military turns against the government, that's when you get Caesar, right? That's, that's Julius Caesar. That is like end game for you. Um, and so the fact that Burke sees this coming, right, the fact that we are still up against this now with our own oligarchic mismanagement is really quite shocking. Um, before I close us out, having now said something uh, pretty heavy, I want to offer a note of hope because as I said before, right, we are not, we are not at the point of taking up arms. Do not mistake me to be saying that. We are not there. Um, all I'm saying is we're flirting, right? We're flirting with these dangerous forces that uh, Burke saw in the French Revolution. The other thing he saw, though, is that in England, where he was afraid this kind of spirit would take root, right? In England, the people who cheered on the terror, the French Revolution, the terrible things that went on there, right, were in the minority. They were just very loud. And this turned out to be true because after... Burke's tenure, his life, his career, right? There was the era of William Pitt the Younger, who was basically, a, you know, the Pittite revulsion with, um, with all these ideas of, of sort of French revolution, right? So, so these things, uh, you know, did not take hold of Britain in the same way that they took hold of, of France in the same way that now they have been kind of imported into America, right? And the reason for this is that Burke saw that the English spirit was not being expressed by people like Dr. Price, by these societies that were expressing loud approval and applause, right? Um, here is what Burke has to say, and we'll close with this. He says, to tell you the truth, my dear sir, writing to this young Frenchman, I think the honor of our nation to be somewhat concerned in the disclaimer of the proceedings of this society of the old Jewry and the London, London Tavern. That's Dr. Price's sermon. I have no man's proxy. I speak only from myself. When I disclaim, I do with all possible earnestness, all communion with the actors in that triumph or with the admirers of it. When I assert anything else as concerning the people of England, I speak from observation, not from authority. 
but I speak from the experience I have had in a pretty extensive and mixed communication with the inhabitants of this kingdom of all descriptions and ranks after a course of attentive observation began in early life and continued near 40 years. I have often been astonished, considering that we are divided from you by but a slender dike of about 24 miles, and that the mutual intercourse between the two countries has lately been very great, to find how little you seem to know of us. He's saying, France is so close by, but you seem to think you have this distorted opinion of us. Why? Why do you think of us as revolutionaries when really we're not? I suspect that this is owing to your forming a judgment of this nation from certain publications, which do very erroneously, if they do at all, represent the opinions and dispositions generally prevalent in England. The vanity restlessness, petulance, and spirit of intrigue of several petty cabals who attempt to hide their total want of consequence in bustle and noise and puffing and mutual quotation of each other makes you imagine that our contemptuous neglect of their abilities is a mark of general acquiescence in their opinions. He's saying these people don't warrant our attention and you think that means that we approve of them because we're not saying anything about them. No such thing, I assure you. Because half a dozen grasshoppers under a fern make the field ring with their importunate chink, whilst thousands of great cattle reposed beneath the shadow of the British oak chew the cud and are silent. Pray do not imagine that those who make the noise are the only inhabitants of the field, that of course there are many in number, or that after all they are other than the little, shriveled, meager, hopping, though loud and troublesome, insects of the hour. Hey, have you guys checked out The Liz Wheeler Show yet? If you have not, if you for some reason did not listen to me about this last week, you really are missing out. And you should go find The Liz Wheeler Show wherever you get your podcasts. My friend Liz is a firebrand. She is so good at just you know, like pulling no punches, going on offensive in the culture wars, which is exactly what we need. I mean, we've had way too much standing athwart history, yelling stop, way too much going on the defensive. Liz has no time for that. She's great to listen to. Again, it's called The Liz Wheeler Show, and you can get it wherever you get your podcast. The reaction has been off the chain. She's climbing the charts. It is so, so cool. If you're not listening, you're missing out. Go check it out. It's produced by the same people that produce this podcast, Soundfront, my friends who do Young Heretics and Verdict with Ted Cruz and all of these great shows. You know their work is amazing because you know this show is amazing. I mean, come on, right? So everything they do is incredible. The Liz Wheeler Show is incredible. She does fantastic research on every issue, every controversy, every time. Go listen. Now, our situation is not quite the same as Burke's for one important reason. The people who hate the West, who hate this country, who hate the foundations that we stand upon are very prominent and very much in power. Biden's ambassador to the UN recently said that our founding documents are woven through with racism, with white supremacy, with everything nasty. Right? He said this in public in an outward facing way to the world. I am as appalled by that as as you are. That is an appalling thing. And it, it raises the hackles. It makes one furious. It makes one feel impotent, right? It makes one feel that there is like this enormous force of darkness enveloping our society. To that extent, we unfortunately cannot say what Burke says, which is that we don't pay attention to these people because they don't matter. But we can, I believe, say what he says, which is that the people, the people of this country still, still, I know that they're being radicalized. I know that they're teaching this garbage in the schools. But if you go out into your community, ask yourself whether you see pure radicalism or whether you see a good people, beleaguered, beaten down, but a good people who do not believe this garbage, who love their home, who love where they are, who love, you know, the, who still, even after the oligarchs have tried to scoop their brains out with a melon baller, who still believe in basic principles of, of individual liberty, of, of equality, right, as, as rightly understood within our founding documents, who love America, who want to see her succeed. There are a lot of those people out there, and just because they're not the loud ones doesn't mean they are not the many. The prophet Elijah says, take heart and take courage, for those that are with you are greater than those that are against you. And there is, I believe, one with us who will see us through this dark hour with more strength, courage, and cavalry than we could ever have hoped for or imagined. That's what I have to say to you about Edmund Burke. Let's do the mailbag.
Mailbag questions come to me on Locals, which is where we have gone to create the Young Heretics community. It's a way to take this show further, to help support it, and to talk more deeply about all the stuff we love, these great traditions of the West which are under such assault, and to do so without the intervention of big tech censorship. I saw, I was seeing my reach start to slip away on Twitter for no reason other than that some idiot decided that, like, you know, the deplorables must all be kicked off or whatever. And so I created this community on Locals. There's a platform made by my pal, Dave Rubin, who really, you know, is a staunch defender of liberty and free speech. The VIPs on Locals are able to get all sorts of extra stuff that you don't get from just listening to the show. They get the episodes a week in advance, get Q&As, live Q&As, all sorts of personal stuff that I share about, you know, like, you know, workout tips and what's on my bookshelf, what I'm reading these days. And, and, and they get to be in the mailbag, which is really cool. I get to hear more from the VIPs and they get to ask me questions. So it's youngheretics.com slash locals to sign up. You really should sign up for the the annual membership because it's the best price and you you won't regret it, I promise. So youngheretics.com slash locals. Here's a mailbag question from Matt. Spencer. I find that I have to listen to certain people and their podcasts multiple times because they are so deep and compelling. For example, your podcast on the screw tape letters will take multiple listens to fully digest. If some of the greatest thinkers of our past had a podcast, who do you think would be the most compelling? Would it be Aristotle, Plato, Nietzsche, Dante, Homer, C.S. Lewis, or perhaps someone you haven't talked about yet? What are your thoughts? So this is a really fun question, and I think that podcasting is like a different art than really anything else. It's different from writing, which is what I do most of the time when I'm not doing this show. It's different from thinking, certainly, because when you think, you can kind of make your own connections in your head that only make sense to you. It's different from reading, right? All other intellectual work is different from podcasting, which is like being in a room with somebody, right? The thing about this show that I always feel like is so important is that when I'm looking into that camera and talking into that microphone, what I'm really doing is I'm trying to speak into your life. I'm trying to share stuff with you that is going to ennoble you, inspire you, that's going to teach you a better way of living and you know guide you on this path that we are all on, right? Toward virtue, toward the good, toward sanity. Um, so some people, like Dante, for example, I sort of wonder, you know, like, or Machiavelli, right? Machiavelli does not strike me as a very companionable author. There are some times when he says, like, I love going into my studio and having this, my study rather than having this conversation with the ancients, but I sort of feel like, you know, he'd be a bit prickly to deal with, um, even though obviously his work merits re reading and rereading and, you know, um, I, on the other hand, right, and, and Nietzsche, for example, was like an erotic who ended up like having a nervous breakdown, you know, um, Plato, on the other hand, right, whose whole life was shaped by this kind of conversational, discursive mode of philosophy, that would be awesome. It would be like being in the, the you know, the, the, his podcast would be called The Academy, and it would just be, you know, discourses on the, the true, the good, and the beautiful. Um, Lewis would probably do good. He, he was, you know, it was a radio broadcaster. Uh, Mere Christianity was, was on the radio. Uh, I think before it was, was published, it was on the radio. Homer would be great uh, because, of course, he was an oral poet, <laughs> and so he would be great at this sort of extemporizing. You have to get good at patter, right? You have to get good at kind of like coming up with things and following thoughts, but then staying on your track, and I think Homer would be the master at that. Oh, man, there are so many. Um, I would. I have always really loved a few of the Stoics, um, you know, Chrysippus, Zeno of Sidium, uh, Zeno of Babylon, these names that we've touched on them when we did Diogenes Laertius. Diogenes Laertius would have a great podcast, a biographer of philosophers, right? Tell us all these stories, pull, pull up a chair and let me tell you these stories and we reflect on how they, uh, on how they, you know, on how they, what they say about people's philosophy. Uh, so, you know, the, there are there are a lot of them from the great that we've talked about from the great traditions of the West. There are also some that I sort of feel like, eh, I'm not sure that I would really want to listen to Nietzsche talking all along. But I'm sure somebody's going to say like, oh, I would love that. You know, I want more more Nietzsche pod in my life, please. Um, but no, I think, you know, probably probably Homer, Herodotus. Oh, my gosh. Herodotus would be amazing. You remember when Tom Holland talked about how this was the person I'd like to have dinner with, you know. Um, so you want somebody that's really going to be companionable. And that's something that I look for in a book sometimes too, you know, someone that you want to spend time with. Um, 
And yeah, I, I, I love this question. I think it's really, it's really fun. And hopefully, you know, in the kingdom of heaven, we will listen to all these podcasts because these guys will all be around uh, smoking cigars and talking. Okay. Thanks, Matt, for the mailbag. Great to have you as a VIP. One more time, if you want to become a VIP member of the Young Heretics community, go to youngheretics.com slash locals, where you can sign up, check out that annual membership. That's how you get the best deal. Um, and one more time, it's youngheretics.com slash locals locals. Okay, this has been a two-part series on Edmund Burke's reflections on the revolution in France. It's been a joy. If you like this show, you will love what we do at the Claremont Institute, the American Mind, AmericanMind.org, and the Claremont Review Books, ClaremontReviewBooks.com. Help us out to recover and defend the American idea by going to Claremont.org slash donate and let them know in the notes that you heard about Claremont through Young Heretics. It's such a joy to be with you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. I will see you next week for more truth, beauty, and the stuff that matters.